Hello and welcome to For the Love of Nature, a podcast where we tell you everything you need to know about nature and probably more than you wanted to know. I'm Laura Fox LaPole. And I'm Katie Holloway. And today we're talking about fossils. Ooh. Nature news first. Yeah. Because I'm excited to get into the, uh, the yeah, fossils. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It is so a real quick. Real quick oh, nature news. I was going to say, because yeah, this, yeah, yeah. this episode is it's not dense. It's just, it's fossils. And so it's really interesting. So we're going to try to make it. Yeah. It's like technical and also like, whoa. Yeah. I promise you, we will tell you mind-blowing facts today. I agree. I think I can almost guarantee that. Okay, well, my nature news, real quick, it's, you know, I've done dinosaurs and fossils for all my nature news, but I'm not doing it for fossils. <laughs> the one episode. So, um, back in March, um, this article says, researchers name newly discovered insects after legendary Pokemon. Oh. Uh, yeah, so two I mean, why not? Why not? No, right, you can name it whatever you want. Um, so two entomologists decided to name their recently discovered new species of Australian beetles, um, Binburum, that's like their genus. All of them are Binburum. Okay, okay. There's Binburum articuno, Binburum multres, and Binburum zapdos. Um, so all three legendary Pokemon are now true things. <laughs> they're just not Pokemon, they're beetles. I wonder if kids are going to try to catch them all now. <laughs> In Australia? Yeah. I'd be scared. Yeah. Is this Articuno? Yeah. No. Oh, gosh. You know, like... <laughs> Uh, that's fun though. I mean, that's fun. And I do, I mean, I remember whenever the Pokemon Go stuff started coming out, they did like a lot of zoos, museums really hopped on trying to put some science around it. So that's really fun. Yeah. All right. Ready for my nature news? Sure. It's finally happening. All right. So the alien reports were released. Oh, thank goodness. Yes. All right. Um, but. I've seen some hokey stuff. Yeah. But we've had no explanation. So that's the government's official stance. Um, So Katie's middle school X-File loving self was really waiting for some doozies. Uh, But there are like, and I think we've talked about this not on the podcast, but I think outside of the podcast, that there are people, especially on Reddit, that sleuth through like the released CIA files and things like that. Um, that have been declassified, and so I'm really excited to see you um, as those guys are sleuthing through more than information. But, so, for those of you who don't know, and we've definitely talked about this before on the podcast, but they were going to be releasing um, the government, when I say they, uh, they were put together a task force to look into and to officially release any of the military's reports on whether aliens exist. So that was finally released uh, on Friday, what, end of June-ish. Um, yeah. And it basically, out of the 143 official reports since 2004 um, that have remained unexplained, the document that was released Friday by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence said, of those 21 reports of unknown phenomenon involving 18 episodes possibly demonstrate technological capabilities that are unknown to the United States. That's what I heard right? that they said, too. And, and, and it's basically just a cop-out of being like, could be. Yeah, yeah, they took... Don't know. Yeah, they don't want to <laughs> take a hard stance and collapse our economy. So they're just yeah. <laughs> taking the, Meh, I don't know. Um, but could be the Russians, could be aliens. Well, they, they did, you know, they like, all did, yeah, they all did agree that it, they do not believe that it's Russia or China just because of the, the I think, like, there were some very specific cases where they say like the rapid acceleration um the the just the propulsion rate what they do they're like there's just no way like there's no way that there is another country that the u.s wouldn't be allied with because a lot of yeah yeah right yeah um because i mean u.s has allies all over the world but you know we share and we talk um but the countries that we don't know about Russia, China, what they have going on, they don't believe that this they that this is coming from them whatsoever. So, but unfortunately it was only like a 9-page document, so less than 10 pages, so it's really not that exciting, but yeah, basically they just took a stance of me maybe. Yeah. Such Lame. a bummer, right? Lame. Just own it. Either say yes or no, but again, I'm sure they just like don't want to 
cause of so many implications yeah, yeah right of telling telling humans okay guys listen don't panic but um we're not alone and we know it and we have proof now now don't and there's freak out nothing we could do yeah. if they did anything yeah. but yeah but i think that, that would be the scary implications just just an fyi um yeah, yeah. Uh, so so People we'll see lose it, especially after what we've all just been through right and I think like it couldn't be it it couldn't happen like I mean we're not ready I w- I would say but I I would say if we were ever ready to be told that there are aliens you might as well follow it up on like the most insane year Agreed. I think you're probably right Just because give it to somebody while we're down and then yeah like, ah whatever f it yeah no one will care like that yeah, yeah so, right yeah we're already oh, at the point who cares we might as well <laughs> just tell us now I'll be like man <laughs> all right let's let's see what else we got to do here so yeah that is my nature news I mean nature-ish aliens we've talked yeah, about astrobiology biology yeah so cool 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 I want to believe x files poster I'm sure I'm sure there is there has to be there has to be yeah it's just terrifying yeah you know, don't want to think about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> moving on. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on, we're going to talk about fossils today. Woo-hoo. And we're going to talk about how we rely on fossils to tell us the important story of our past. And uh, I think this is, is the first of many dinosaurs. Because we've talked about dinosaurs oh, yeah. so many times. And, and there's it, so many different things to talk about. And this is our first official dinosaur episode oh yeah yeah okay yeah. okay gotta think we yeah. have tons of news yeah <laughs> we really like it paleontology so. is just constantly discovering yeah things, so yeah um so yeah we're gonna talk about how it helps us tell the story of our past which of course like duh you kind of think but there's lots of implications for fossils mm-hmm. but i'm gonna start out with um like what is a fossil and how does it form to give everybody some background you know, which I, hang I assume, in there, folks. It's way more interesting than it sounds. I promise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of course, I'm sure most of you, when you think of a fossil, you're thinking of like a rock that has dinosaur bones in it. Oh, I, you know, something like that. But there are so many more fossils than just that. So, what is a fossil? Um, actually, there's a lot of definitions, and but what I found uh, is that a fossil is the preserved remains or traces of an animal plant or fungi from a past geological period so some some key points there um it has to be from a past geological period so like makes sense dead animal bones on the side of the road don't count (laughs) as fossils um and uh it's preserved remains or traces and Mm -hmm. that's a big deal yes that's a huge deal necessarily the thing it could also be evidence of the thing Mm -hmm. so fossils are kind of broken into two two groups there's body fossils which are teeth, bones, shells, etc. What you normally think of. And then there's trace fossils. And those, that's broken into two groups, I found out. Oh, so interesting. So there's, there's ichnofossils, which are tracks, yes, burrows, okay, okay. and, and yeah. coprolites, which is poo. Poop. And then there's chemofossils and biosignatures, which is chemical evidence of decomposition, even if nothing else is there. Or like like metabolism evidence yeah kind of like what we were talking about with our astrobiology yeah. stuff yeah, yeah. how there's biosignatures so that's what a fossil is so how does it form well uh i discovered I-, I knew a little bit about fossil formation but not nearly enough uh it's basically has to have the exact right conditions it's how we talked about in astrobiology we talked about the goldilocks zone yep. for life yep it's kind of like that for fossils it has to be the exact right conditions yes. And biggest one of those is that it needs to be a quick burial, very fast, which explains it can't just be slow decomp. Yeah, and that, but that it does explain why. Because you think of all the animals, okay, of all the animals right. in the past, there should why be. Why can we find all of them? Yeah, and 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 that yeah. is why because it has to be quick. Something exactly. has to happen in which it needs to be a quick burial. Yeah, and there are a couple ways this can happen. So I'm just gonna go into a couple, um, and uh, and then we'll keep going. So first off probably what most of us think of as a fossil. It's called permineralization. So it has to do with minerals. About 99% of the fossils that we find are marine fossils, Mm -hmm. which I kind of blew my, I mean, make totally makes sense when I hear it, but wouldn't, you didn't think about it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, It's not. Yeah. Except for, I mean, in PA, that's all you find is, you know, ocean. Ocean. I mean, same thing here in Texas. It's it's just because that's what it used to be. Yes, it's what it used to be, and because they're able to sink to the mud and sand mm-hmm. at the bottom, which yep. is quickly covering them up and starts the process. 
Whenever we find any other type of fossil, it's usually lived near water of some sort that also buried it quickly. So that could be like a dinosaur that lived near a lake, or it could be that there was like a, a flood and all the sediment covered a body, but it usually has to do with water it, th- it, for this, for yes. permineral- permineralization. Yep. Um, so what happens is it's buried in sediment of some sort. And it slowly decomposes where there's no, there's almost no air. It's like locked in there. And so it really slows things down and gives things time. So as the soft bits rot away, which is gross, but okay. <laughs> the more soft bits. <laughs> the soft as bits. the soft bits rot away. <laughs> uh, I, I just think, of, yeah. As the soft bits rot away, more and more sediment is piled on top, which creates pressure. And then that pressure creates rock. And that's how our sedimentary rock is made. It's just pressure, 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 slowly turning mud into rock. And so, um, meanwhile, water is seeping into that pocket, and it seeps into the bones and the teeth and the other hard parts, where it leaves behind minerals and, like, crystallizes the remains. Mm -hmm. And so that's the traditional fossil that you're thinking of. Like, when you see paleontologists digging up a dinosaur, this it's is it. usually, like, it's actually bone, but it's become, like, hardened bone, almost like rock itself, surrounded by rock. Okay, but that's not the only way. Carbonization is another really cool one. Um, I really want to find out. This is, like, it's my dad's personal goal and also <laughs> one of mine. I've never found a carbonization fossil. But yeah, this would be really neat. And it's what gives you the really awesome detail. This is the process um, where something is buried in sediment, but it usually, this is something that happens with plants, fish, or other soft-bodied animals like amphibians and reptiles. Mm -hmm. So as sediment builds up over the top of the decomposing remains, the pressure forces the release of carbon, um, you know, which all of us have, like we're made up of carbon. And it uh, leaves a detailed, almost stamp-like image. So this is what you're thinking of when you think of those cool fern or fish fossils, where it's almost like a stamp or a black imprint. Yeah, like ins- like insane, insane detail, yeah, you too. you can see yeah. super detailed stuff. But again, only happens with a couple of things and only happens under certain conditions. I'm so jealous because I'm in a lot of, like, fossil uh, Facebook groups here in Texas, and uh-huh. when people find, like, the really good, I'm like, oh, yeah, I hate you. I found so cool ones in my life, but, yeah, not not anything crazy. Yeah. Like, I have, I have found tons of marine stuff. Mm-hmm. Basic, like shells. Yeah. I found trilobites. Mm-hmm. And I have a, a really cool sandstone snail, which I'll talk about in one of my processes. Oh, perfect. Okay. So, that will take us to the next one, which is molds and casts. Mm -hmm. So, this is when sediment fills or surrounds remains, but the original animal plant or plant rots away, leaving only a mold or a cast, and a cast is an imprint. So, I found, like, a cast of a, like, a big snail about as big as my fist, and so there was no like shell a, like, left. Like not an ammonite, but a, like a sna- like a snail. Yeah, it actually oh, looked like a snail, snail. Cool. And it was in sandstone. So I and I there was no shell left, but I could I popped it out, mm-hmm. and it was like whatever was inside of that shell when it rotted away. So cool, that's cool. like a mold or a cast of something. And then there's replacement fossilization, which is super similar to permineralization. But this is, instead of there being any actual bone left, this is all that's left is the minerals from the water. So it looks like bones, but it really is just mineral, like mineralized rock. Um, two more, almost done. Organic material is considered fossils. So that's like, you know, sometimes scientists can still find organic material in fossils, although it is rare, um, and it's a sp- Especially hard in the above processes, but not unheard of. They have found DNA in permineralized fossils mm-hmm. and things like that. But the following, uh, the following way is much better um, to find that, and that's through preserved remains. So that's when the entire, or at least most, of the plant, animal, or fungi is preserved nearly intact when it died. Um, so it gives an exceptional amount of clues and information about what the creature or plant was like. It can allow DNA extraction, and it gives a snapshot of that period in time. So that's things like insects trapped in amber, um, tar pits that have preserved whole things, 
bogs, which are acidic and preserve bodies and like mummify them, Mm -hmm. and then ice. So these are the rarest types of fossils. It's very hard for us to find them, but when we do, it's like a jackpot because it tells you everything. Like, you can even see what's, what they've eaten. And these are yeah. the ones that I'm going to be talking about in a little bit then, That's too. That's awesome. Yeah. So that is all the different types of fossilization that I could find. So, you know, there's, there's permineralization, where it hardens the bone. Carbonization makes a stamp. Replacement replaces the bones with minerals, molds and casts, and then preserved remains. I'm taking a hard deep dive back to my... Uh, museum tour guide days here with this episode <laughs> and then for it. and rehashing all right so now that laura's explained you know what a fossil is and the bajillion different ways they can form I, i'm going to talk to a little bit more about uh which is what our message is for the episode and it's the important stories that fossils can tell us about our past all right so to start off i would say one of the major things that we can learn from fossils is how our earth was physically moved And plants and animals have moved as well. Um, Animals have only existed for the last 540 million years out of the... Like a blink. Yeah, Yeah. it really is. It's a blink because they're estimating the Earth's origin was like in the billions of years ago. Um, So we're just mostly going to focus on the last 540 million years or so in this episode since that's when fossils have typically most existed. At at least the cool ones anyway. Um, <laughs> the cool ones. And, and I say or so because plants predate animals, of course, and there are plenty of plant fossils. And fungi predates plants. Yep. And so, so there's tons of them, but again, we're, we're, we'll focus for this episode just on like the, the big fossils. Whenever we say the fossils, that's what you think of. All right. So studying these early plant fossils definitely gives us a look at how the earth once existed and how it has shifted over time. For instance, how a large portion of the U.S. was underwater, which is what Laura and I were talking about a little bit ago. Mm-hmm. Um, if you remember back to your elementary school days, plate tectonics are a thing. Yes, um, I had to write a paper on that to get into my advanced science course for high school. Really interesting. Yeah, I had to write a paper during the summertime. That sucks. To be able to get it. Right. <laughs> on plate it tectonics. It, but it was on plate tectonics. Ugh. So rando. Yeah, that is an uh, interesting topic. Like, a, like you said, a random one. Um, but... So all of Earth's land once existed in one large island called Pangaea. Um, All right, so as plates started to move, forming continents that we know today, we had large mountain forms, sections underwater that aren't today, and we truly wouldn't have known about any of this without fossils. Um, Yes, rock itself and geology, of course, can tell us some aspects of history, but fossils give us a better idea of what types of plants, animals existed, and where. When it, right. Yeah, I think like you could I think most of us could swallow it from a geologist, but I definitely think it hits at home mm-hmm. and right there's so much extra to know yes. about the conditions yeah. of that. Yeah. Oh yeah, goodness. Um so when paleontologists start to find a large number of shelled and other obvious water-dwelling creatures in an area like they did in Texas and where Laura is, uh then we can start to look at hey, this was probably once covered in water. Um and and use geology to kind of, you know, take a yeah see boundaries yeah things like that so it it helps us to paint that picture um we can also see how animals have moved over time for instance laura and i went down a deep rabbit hole one day Um, i was wondering if this would come up (laughs) when we were never forget it (laughs) right when we were working at the zoo together and discovered that camels originated here in north america yep and I really think I need to start a campaign to bring back wild camels to North America, but that's that's besides the Rewilding. point. Rewilding. Rewilding. Yeah, actually, man, that's one of the easiest. With camels. Ones. With camels. Yeah. You know, forget camels the carnivores. Forget the carnivores that people want to rewild and bring back. Let's do camels. Uh, <laughs> so somehow we need to make that into a t-shirt. Rewild. I, mean, I guess it would be, you know, it's... it's Rewild like, the camels. Yeah. yeah. If not camels, <laughs> then just vast herds of wild llamas because that yeah, would be the right. next, yeah, right. in the same family. The next thing. Uh, so fossils do give a great timeline of how not only our earth has moved in shape but how animals have moved as well because obviously we don't have camels here in North America anymore. Um, so fossils give us a fantastic di- timeline of really cool events that have happened in our past. Now let's start to break down the huge timeline of our past to further help us understand you know some of the more details of what fossils can tell us. For instance, climate change. 
Fossils provide a lot of information about climate change. For example, by examining fossils and geology. I'm going to just keep saying geology because I feel like we have to acknowledge them. <laughs> no, I feel like they have to work closely together. Yeah, even though that's like not... Geology is definitely not one of my stronger sciences whatsoever. No, mine either, but I'm really interested in it. Yeah. Like, I think it's fascinating that, that I don't know much. That's kind of how I am with uh, genetics. I find it... In- incredibly fascinating, but I did horribly in that class. Right. Horribly in that class. Um, so anyway, by, by examining fossils, uh, scientists were able to tell about the comet that struck that uh, that struck Earth, essentially wiping out the vast majority of dinosaurs and drastically altering the Earth's atmosphere. Scientists were also able to determine what led up to the Ice Age and how the Earth was altered after it. How are they able to do this? Well, just like today... Plants and animals are adapted for climate they live in. Warm weather, warm weather plants typically have broad leaves with smoother edges, while plants in cold weather are more narrow with jagged edges. Two professors at Penn State University, whoop, whoop, uh, Dr. <laughs> Dana Royer and Dr. Peter Rip Wilf, have studied this and ha- have studied like the plants and the broad leaves and short leaves. Yeah. Um, and they've determined that the, the reason for this is that the jagged edges on leaves have more xylem in them. Xylem is a type of transport tissue, uh, which helps to move water from roots to the stems and sap. In the spring, when leaves, like where Laura is, uh, in, in northeastern U.S., the leaves are just starting to form after a cold winter. They lose more water than leaves without teeth. The xylem yeah. then pulls up more nutrients from the roof to provide from the roots to provide nourishment for the plants and give the plant a kickstart to their photosynthesis process. Scientists right. That's why they have to lose leaves. They have to keep them all yep. year like the needles. Yeah, yeah, they have to. So scientists who study this information today can analyze fossil records to predict what changes in climate are going to occur. Now we ne- now we won't necessarily be able to predict when a comet is coming, you know. Of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wish we could. Um, yeah. Or the drastic increase in CO two that humans have added to our atmosphere, which throws like a curveball in everything, dating wise. Um, scientists can tell when, we're, but scientists can't can tell when we're heading for a disaster, like climate change but what right or like right now. natural cycles yes yeah would be obvious yeah like we can like they can tell the natural cycles and then just given our co2 in the path where projected we're screwed right, like right. so so they can see like something bad is going to happen and that's why they're saying hey probably should look at this it's not gonna end well um so same as astrobiology look to the past to understand the future but i guess in this case it's Look at the present to somewhat understand the past to then understand the future. The future. Yeah. <laughs> so it's complicated. Right? So understanding climate change is extremely important, but I won't, don't want to dwell on that too long because I'll end up curled up in a corner in my office under a blanket. Totally. So moving on. <laughs> Just crying the rest what of the else episode. What fossils tell us? Um, something more cheerful. Um, another thing we can learn from fossils, and this is just going to be my last because it really is like a, like a ton, but um, ancient cultures. And I think we forget about this often. So, yes, we do find fossilized human remains. Um, yes. Just like we can study movements of prehistoric animals, we can study movement of cultures of ancient peoples. Now, what's crazy about human fossils is we've only been able to discover about 6,000 individuals. Again, like Laura says, there needs needs to be very particular situations. Again, a Goldilocks zone. Someone has to fall into a ball. Yeah, yeah, right. to death in ice. They have to. A flood. Die in a river. Yeah, Yeah. something catastrophic and quick. Um, So out of 6,000 individuals from all of our past, um, small sample size, but sizable enough that we can learn about early humans. So some of the things we have learned are how male and female structures have changed to not only adapt to climate, but social structures and how Mm -hmm. quickly children grew up. Um, years ago when scientists were first discovering humans, and I feel like many people still think this way, everyone assumes that we came from like one yes. line of humans. And I'm going to go into this a lot more with my Oh, perfect, first, my perfect. Find. So, good, because mine is just, like, surface. It's very surface. So that's perfect. Um, so, it's because that's not the, not the case at all. Just like any other mammal, humans have changed drastically over time, um, given where they live. So, just like any other family tree, there are numerous branches, and one early human that lived in the Eastern Hemisphere is completely different than those that lived in the Western Hemisphere. 
I, yeah, I definitely think that most people think it's just one tree. A line. Yeah. A line. Yeah. yeah. It's just one well, line. Us back to chimpanzees. Yeah. Which just is straight. Completely wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it, it's just like any other mammal. I mean, we're, we're a mammal, so no different. Um, our understanding of our past has grown so drastically that since 1974 and one of the first discoveries of early man, the branches of human evolutionary tree have more than doubled. Oh, I'm sure. And that's, that to me, that's crazy. That's in 70, I mean, seven, 1974 is not right, that long ago. that's not that long ago. The last 50 years? Yeah. And it's more than doubled. Um, so while there are several different types of homo sapiens and homo, whatever is there are completely different types of humans that once lived all and we know this all because of fossils so um so I, cool yeah and again I, I don't know if you're gonna go through just like the group of homo sapiens and the homo like not all the other no, okay not all no. okay, okay but there there are quite a few okay um but and this is a big but we have a long way to go Oftentimes, when discovering fossils, we rarely ever get an entire set. Some bones. Yes. <laughs> I think that's what a lot of people don't understand, <laughs> yeah. too. It's like you find four pieces of the whole skeleton. And now we've and made a whole considered. dinosaur. No, you yes. haven't. Um, and so, <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, scientists are literally left to just pick up the pieces and make yeah. some drastic inferences as to how and what the species looked and like and made lived. And many mistakes in the past. So many. And it wasn't... The brontosaurus! Right? That was my favorite dinosaur and it didn't even... Ha- it wasn't even real. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, in, in the next... Okay, so there was a... There is... I can't remember what the na- what they named it now. But it's a, right. the long next... They found something. What we, yeah. what we used... What we used to call the brontosaurus, did they completely nix that dinosaur, or is it? I think that they might have, or they discovered a new one and then called that the brontosaurus. But I think the skeleton so, that we knew as the brontosaurus is not yes. A dinosaur. So think back, uh, let's see, your '90s kids, maybe early 2000s. Anytime you thought of a brontosaurus, you know, very very tall, upright neck. You know, with a low... Little s- foot. Yeah, little foot. It, and that does <laughs> not make sense um, whatsoever because the neck. It would just be top. It would be top heavy. Like there's no way it could hold its neck up. And then they're like, "Oh goodness, yeah, no, it can't." Like they just thought it was gonna be like a giraffe. No, its neck is outright, and so its tail is level with its head and neck. So it's yeah, more yeah. more and of they, a line. They built, they built the skeleton. Yeah, but they built it based on their own assumptions, mm-hmm. not based on how it actually is. And that's how it, you. I mean, that's how it all has to be. Yes, we're doing our educated guess best. Based on modern day things. Yep. And then we just have to keep discovering and keep building on it. So it wasn't until the 90s that China discovered a dinosaur with feathers. Previous to this, all dinosaurs were drab in color and scaly like reptiles. Um, So like Laura said earlier, you know, a lot of paleontologists, they might find a jaw piece here, cranium piece over there. Um, And it's just going to keep taking time before we can find more and more fossils to get a better picture. Um, yeah, and I think that leads you to the 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 thing too that like that we have no, or at least that I'm aware of, we have no like solid family trees. You have to skip one every now and like oh like yeah yeah have, like our our common descent line is very like, as far as humans go. And, and oh yeah, things. yeah. We've had to make some giant jumps from one species especially, to another especially with timeline. humans yeah especially yeah. with humans because so many of the human species we found it, it literally was like one jaw piece yeah. and that was and, it and then just thinking like okay like what did that come from yep we don't know yeah. what that came you know what i mean and like, i wish scientists were more comfortable with saying we don't yeah, know. Yeah, because I think when you're taught stuff like that in school, you're it's very like, all right, well, we know this happened. Mm-hmm. And like science is always like usually very factual, but this is definitely like it's theory. Yeah. And people have to understand it's theory. Yeah. To a point, although I know some people are going to come back and be like, no, there are some. And yeah, sure. But yeah, and everyone has to be comfortable saying, listen, there are huge gaps. Yeah. And I wish we, probably, we might fi- fill them in, and we might never fill them in. And I, and I wish again, I wish scientists were more comfortable with saying, like, I found something really amazing. This is going to revolutionize and change it. Uh, we just have a lot of questions left unanswered instead of just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. this is what it is. This is what it has to be. Um, so anyway, all in all, fossils tell us about our past. Literally, um, it's really some of the only physical evidence we have to help us understand uh, about what earth used to be like 
Uh, but just yeah. as I said, we have a long way to go because sometimes understanding a piece of history is just that. We only have a piece and we have to use context clues, ba- basically context clues, to figure out the rest. So while paleontology, anthropology, and other fields may seem obscure in the information age, boy, do we have, there, it's really important. Um, and we have so, so, so much more to learn about. Yeah, it. because can you imagine like, you know, like paleontology, I mean, people have found bones, I'm sure, since time immemorial, and that's where mm-hmm. the stories of dragons have come from and things yep. like that. But, like, actually, like, as a science, it's pretty new. It is. It really like, is. In the grand scheme of things. Yeah. And that's and that's when we started piecing together our past. Mm-hmm. So hopefully you guys picked up on some of that. I had to talk fast because I have a lot of information. <laughs> I had a lot of information to get through, and we have so much more to go through. So hopefully, yeah. if not, go back and uh, use your podcast app and, and slow it down because I, I wanted to get through <laughs> it all so you guys wouldn't be here for four hours listening to all that. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to keep on trucking with what you were just talking about. And this, this, is, this should be the best parts of the episode yes. here. So we decided to go over what it is, how it forms, why it's important, and now it's the important finds that we found in the past. The crazy <laughs> things. The highlights. Yes. Um, so my one highlight, um, is Lucy, um, who goes right along with what Kitty was saying. So here we go. Some of you have probably heard of Lucy before. Uh, she was a very early hominin or hominid, depending uh, on how you say it, aka one of our ancestors that helped us rewrite our knowledge of human history. So that date of 1974, that's where this comes from. So her remains were discovered back in 1974 by Donald Johansson and Tom Gray in Ethiopia. And here's what kills me, okay? It was a complete accident. Yes. Yeah, they weren't looking. I was so like, <laughs> what? Yeah. Some people have all the freaking look. They were literally taking a shortcut through a gorge and mm-hmm. noticed some bones sticking out of the ground. And then they Come just on. made one of the largest scientific discoveries of our yes. time. <laughs> totally. I was like, man. So they decided to call her Lucy because while they were celebrating, um, like, that night about finding her, they were playing the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds by the Beatles because, you know, it's the 70s. <laughs> so uh, why not? So they were like, why not? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so she's Lucy, named for the Beatles song. So we know that she was a hominin or hominid because she could walk upright. And that's basically, like, the key, like... That's what a hominid is. Are, are you going to go in? Pedal. Are you going to go into how we can tell? A little up uh, okay. vaguely. Okay. So okay. I was just going to say, but feel free to fill in more. Okay. Scientists can tell this from looking at leg bones, pelvis, mm-hmm. and spine, all which have characteristics that are made for walking upright without it being painful. So like, yes. your leg bones are longer. Mm-hmm. Your spine is more um like curved in a certain way. Your pelvis is. It's all made so that you can carry weight upright, not on all fours. Yeah, I mean, in a, in, a, in a way, now, I mean, this is where scientists do get it wrong. In a way, it is like a puzzle piece. Sometimes, you know, you have to look at the bones that you're given. Okay, is this going to fit here? Does this make sense here? Yes or no? Okay, yes. Right. Okay, but did it really fit this way? Which goes back to the brontosaurus example. Yeah, I think that definitely, like, you know, paleontology is so complicated because I think you also have to be very familiar with anatomy and physiology. So familiar. Like, and geology. <laughs> yeah. And, like, it's like a, you know. It's way more complex than I think what a lot of people. digging up bones. Yeah, and I, yeah, I don't think yeah. people really give it the true, uh. Like, people always think, oh, how hard physics is and, and things like that. But I don't think people realize how tough paleontology can be. Yeah. You don't have to be a creative thinker and a scientist. Yeah. Which is not always an easy combo. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Opposite sides of your brain sometimes. Yeah. Um, so, they decided, uh, scientists determined that Lucy was a, a species that's called Australopithecus mm-hmm. afarensis. Um, and there are lots of other species of astro, as, Australopithecus um, which is not Homo sapien, nope. but is an ancestor. So scientists have never positively determined the cause of Lucy's death for sure, because you can only tell so much from bones, you know. Um, they don't have a, a body to work off of. She was not an intact, it is just bone. Um, so either permineralization or replacement. Um, but they did find uh a carnivore tooth 
puncture in her pubic bone. Mm, interesting. That, I mean, it could have caused her death. Yeah. Um, they're not sure. Or it could have just been a childhood mauling of an animal. Right. Exactly. Yeah. They just, the, all they know is that it was before she died because they can see, like, healing. Um, at least a little bit. Not, like, after, you know, not gnawed on after the fact. <laughs> um... <laughs> So we can tell from Lucy's skeleton, which I always think is cool. You can tell a lot of things from a skeleton. We know that she was young, but she was full grown. So she was a young adult. We know that she was female because of how small she was compared to other species of this that they found. Um, and that she lived And, and you, can, you can also, a lot of times with the females, you can tell pelvic structure. Right, right. And like rib cage stuff yeah. I know too is sometimes... Yeah. Um, so we can tell that, and, and from carbon dating and things, we know that she lived around 3.18 million years ago. Mind-blowing. Yeah. Um, so she would have been about three and a half feet tall, and again, she was full-grown. So about my size. Weighed, <laughs> <laughs> You're not that tiny. <laughs> and she weighed around 60 to 65 pal- pounds, so she was just a little gal. But full-grown. Um, so why was this a significant find? And here's where it gets awesome, because we really did learn a lot from Lucy. And why, like, we say that she rewrote our our understanding of, of humans. So at the time, she was the oldest and most complete hominid ever found. Okay, so 3.18, we're like, whoa, this is so old. And let me tell you what I mean by most complete. <laughs> Most complete is 40%. Yeah, which it was just... So we found 40% yeah. of Lucy's skeleton <laughs> yeah. and and made a lot of conclusions, thankfully, for... I mean, 40% is pretty significant. Yeah, uh, it, I'm sure it's you better, can tell a lot. That's better than most fossil finds. I don't know if yeah. that stat is out there. Go ahead and keep talking. I'm going I'm to see. Know, yeah, I would, it's got to be so small. So this helped us to close the gap a bit between modern day humans and the ancestor we share with chimpanzees. So here's where, you know, the debate really gets heated if you say evolution happens and we are descended from chimps and people are like well why are there still chimps if there's us and things like that okay so think about this like a dog and a wolf a dog isn't necessarily descended from a certain breed of canine Mm -hmm. it might be on the same level of a family tree imagine all these branches at one point yes there was a common ancestor but guess what that common ancestor was not a chimpanzee the chimpanzee's grandpa and our ancestor's grandpa could have been the same. You know what I mean? Like, it's yep. kind of like that. Like, it's, you know, we did not come from chimpanzees. They are in a completely separate line. But we did share an ancestor. But um, the crazy thing is that they've just recently done some DNA tests. Um, and they think that our, our closest common ancestor was as far back as 13 million years ago. So that's about 10 million years further back than Lucy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we still have a big gap, gap. to fill. Yeah. Um, and of course, that means Lucy was way closer to us than she was to chimpanzees. Yes. Which is interesting because we also did find some things about chim- like Like Lucy's skeleton does have more, has a lot of things in common. Um, like they would say it was more ape-like. Only because of things like having... <laughs> Three um, and a half foot tight. <laughs> like, Besides that, yeah. um, they, they specifically mentioned her skull and teeth and arms. Like her arm bones were really long. Her teeth and skull look very ape compared to our skull. Um, but again, I mean, think about... Uh, and that was after 10 million years of descent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway... Um, another really important, so the important thing was one, it got us so much closer at the time to a common ancestor. Um, the other big thing was that Lucy showed us that bipedalism came before large brain size, which Mm -hmm. I thought was fascinating. Yeah. Um, so we walked upright a long time before our brains got bigger, like by a million years, can, like literally can, a million years. Can you imagine a tiny brain, like lower functioning? Like, why am I standing? Like, why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, they just, they just don't know. They just, and there's a, there's multiple theories as to how and why this happened. Um, so they, they, they could, because of her, because of <laughs> they her, just, right, they, they, they just, just could. could. Yeah. They, uh, because she has, she had so many ape-like characteristics, they, they think that Australopithecus probably lived, spent a lot of time in the trees. So maybe bipedalism 
actually is an arboreal trait for walking along branches quickly. Which would make sense. Yeah, that would make sense. If not, another theory um, many scientists believe is that it was an essential, um, comp- like, a-, a way to combat the changes in our diet. And I've seen a lot of documentaries where this is the one that they're toting as as probably the most likely. So at the time of this happening, again, climate change and things like mm-hmm. that, the environment was changing. So there was less trees. They couldn't, you know, arboreal species had to come down more. And because of that, their diet had to change. So before that, they think that, like, before Lucy's species, they were probably mostly eating fruit. But this allowed them to eat more grasses and possibly meat and, like, hunt and things like this. And we know what they were eating because they have found food remains in the fossilized teeth <laughs> of some of these hom- of the Way hominids. before floss existed. Right. And, <laughs> and so, it re- actually, like, you know, if you don't like flossing, you can just hope that you'll become fossilized and it'll all be... Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing this for science. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, like, the two big things. It's... How much we we learned from her, the bipedalism, and then a couple other cool things is they're they're pretty sure, well, it's highly debated. They think Lucy and her relatives may have used tools because they have found in similar, like a similar geological period. Yeah, yeah. Again. So possibly tool use. Yeah. Um, but hard to know. Um, they also believed that she, her... You know, uh, Katie was saying we can tell a lot about ancient cultures. So we think that Lucy lived in probably a small social group and probably one that was male dominated. Why that? Because the females were so much smaller um, and in like a male dominated society, that's usually like um, with several like species, U.S. Yeah. society. Yeah, yeah, that the male is usually much larger to compete for females, yada, yada, yada. Um, So we can we can. Uh, you know, extrapolate some things from that. Um, it's also believed that she matured way faster than we do. So she was a fully grown adult, be it young, but they think that she, based on, like, her bones, I don't know how they know this, but they're pretty sure she died when she was 12. But she was grown up. Uh, it's, so, it has to do with the, clo- a lot of times it has to do with the closing of the growth plates. Like, in the spine and, and, and yeah, around yeah, yeah. your body. So, that's, so, that's and, normally and that how I can tell. tracks more for, like, you know, of course apes mature much faster than we do because mm-hmm. their lifespans aren't as long. So, uh, again, Lucy was grown up at 12. Well, and they have to, too. I mean, you think, I mean, <laughs> do. Oh, yeah. You know, human civilization, as we kind of know it today, you know, we have a pretty easy. Oh, even like, now, yeah. yeah. We have a very we easy. <laughs> we have a very easy lifestyle. So, whereas chimps you know apes of any sort they're quite literally forced to grow up way faster than needed and that's what i think is kind of fascinating because although humans were forced to grow up like mentally Mm -hmm. like you know and and there are certain traits of us like yes of course most most of us girls could probably have babies when we're 12 but a lot of the rest of our body like our brains don't finish developing till 25 so Mm -hmm. there's definitely something about uh, yeah i mean that's Um, why they say that it's better that you marry and make a decision, big life-altering decisions after you're 27. Yeah. I got married at 22. My mom specifically (laughs) told me I shouldn't get married before age 25. For years. Like, she was like, don't do it. (laughs) I got married at 25. (laughs) Or 26. We got married at 22. We were were young. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. 10 years later, here we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't can't be that bad. (laughs) And then last but not least, so also at the time, she was only one of seven hominins known. So we'd we'd only found seven different species at the time. And just like Katie was saying, it's exploded because now we know of at least 20 different species of hominids. Crazy. But unfortunately, we still don't know which ones are our direct ancestors and which are only related. Mind which I think blowing. is so crazy. Yeah, yeah. that like Mind no blowing. answers. We're, we're getting the pieces still. And we may never find out, but I really hope we do. Yeah. It'd be kind of cool. That would be really neat. Alrighty. My important fossil find that I'm going to discuss is Yucca in Layuba, the mammoths. Woo! I'm really excited for this one. So when I did work at a museum and it was a tour guide, um, talking about mammoths was to me, it was just mind blowing. And, and this stood out because this is when I learned about mammoths and 
and their unique case in how we find mammoth fossilized today. Um, well, it, just the preserved remains is so fascinating. It just stood out to me. So hopefully, if we didn't like bog people, I bog, love bog, bog people, yeah, bog people. <laughs> if we didn't, if we didn't blow your mind yet, one, go look up paws and go look up bog people. Yeah. Um, but two, get ready to brace yourself for some of this mammoth stuff. All right. Uh, so a little mammoth background. Mammoths lived from about 5 million years ago to just about 3,500 years ago. Which is so recent. We were so close. Yeah. To so, being able to see mammoths. <laughs> so we're in 2021. So these creatures were walking around about 1,500 BCE, which to put into context, mammoths were around after the pyramids in Giza were built. What? Yeah, is that right? What? Yeah. So while most it was like ten thousand BC or something. No. Wow. Well, well, most went extinct about ten thousand years ago, so it would be about eight thousand BC. Um, okay. but, but there still. there was a lot, and that was most of them. But there was a population uh, that lived north of Russia that got stuck on this island and stuff. And those <laughs> they they like funneled. Okay. I mean, they eventually funneled, and that's what killed them. But anyway, and I'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, so th- that population lived to about 3,500 years ago, so 1,500 B.C. Whoa. So they are closer to us timeline than the pyramids of Giza by about 1,000 years. Whoa. So not a little bit of time. Yeah, a lot of time. Um, so like I said, most one ex- most mammoths, though, went extinct around 10,000 years ago. Uh, we know humans did coexist with mammoths because, although rare, we have dug up mammoth bones with spear marks in them, noting that they were sometimes hunted. Uh, mammoths have seemed to go extinct due to a variety of reasons, uh, but the last have a, just had horrible genetics. So I'm talking about the ones that were on the island. Uh, oh, they, yeah, you can't live on an island forever right? without getting seriously inbred. <laughs> well, they were prone to severe diabetes, low sperm Aww. count, and so much more. Uh, so they, sure. they were eventually going to die out. I mean, Imagine somebody finding those guys and just being like, oh! Ah! Yeah. They're yeah. like all freaks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eight legs. Yeah, yeah. They're missing a trunk. Yeah. Uh, who knows? So the word mammoth comes from two words in the Estonian language, which is ma, which means earth, and mutt, which means mole. <laughs> which, yes, mole. Um, s- s- yes, earth mole. So in Estonia, which is a country, farmers found gigantic bones in their field. They thought that the bones belonged to a huge burrowing animal. Um, which if, oh my god! <laughs> which if you've ever seen, I love that conclusion. Right, huge. I, I mean, found it in the ground. It must, must be have a mole. Been a burrowing animal. <laughs> must be a mole. Um, and if you've ever seen a mammoth bone, if you haven't, go to your nearest natural history museum. Um, but they're not small, so that would have been a heck of a mole, like a heck of a size mole. <laughs> a heck of a mole. Because <laughs> it's huge. Um, I now, Josh, you also need to draw that. Please draw like a mammoth. Popping out of a mole. A mole. <laughs> but a giant one. A mammoth sized mole. <laughs> I mean, it's so cute. To be fair, though, to be fair, maybe they always just found dead babies. You know what I mean? Like maybe they just. What? Like dead mammoth babies, not dead human Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I was so thrown away by that <laughs> phrase. I was like... Dead mammoth babies. Maybe they just gotcha. always found dead mammoth... You know, because they would be smaller. Oh, Because yeah, there's yeah. no way a huge mammoth bone. They're like, surely this must be a mole. Because they're I mean, huge. They, wow. What time period were these found in? You figure they died out 10,000 years ago. No, no, no. But when did the Estonians find them? Uh, I believe it was somewhere between... 15,000 years to the 3,500 years ago. Oh, okay. Well, then, yeah, I b- totally believe they could have thought it was a mole. I mean, they thought dinosaur bones were dragons. So, True. Like, cool. Uh, you know. I mean, I wish they were dragons. Let's bring back dragons, too. I mean, too. kind of are. While we're bringing back camels, we'll bring back dragons, too. I wish. Yeah. All right. So, um, mammoths are 10 to 15 feet in height and the largest weighing about in about six tons. Entire fossilized skeletons of mammoths have been found, and one of the largest skeletons ever found was a Colombian mammoth named Zed, which was unearthed from under an L.A. department store. 
Um, oh, snap. What a fun find. <laughs> right? What makes mammoths so unique is giving their recent proximity to humans and the most notable mammoth, the woolly mammoth, living in such cold climates, which is like Serbia, Russia, scientists have found entire bodies frozen in the ground. I'm talking yeah, yeah, fur, bodies. stomach contents, and all. Um, so cool. There are no guessing games with mammoths, like feathers or no feathers questions with dinosaurs. Right. Because you find the whole thing. There you the, go. It, it's there. Um, and, and so too, just to throw this out there. So we, whenever most people think of mammoth, they think of the woolly mammoth. However, there were tons of mammoths all over the world, uh, that then gave rise to various elephant species. Um, so some, whenever you think of woolly mammoth, not all mammoths looked like the woolly mammoth. Um, a lot of them looked like larger elephants hairier yeah, elephants yeah. um the weird t- i remember in my dinosaur book as a kid like there were like these elephants with like crazy looking mm-hmm. shovel teeth and like weird stuff yeah and so what i'm going to be talking about is the is our woolly mammoths because again found a nice completely preserved and so that's what i'm going to be talking about are those completely preserved mummified ones that we found yeah in comes Lauba. Laiuba was found by a reindeer herder and his two sons in 2007 on the bank of a river. They estimate her age to be about 41,000 years ago. However, her death occurred when she was about 30 days old. Oh, right. Oh, right. I forgot this was a baby. I dead babies. Uh, so, oh, so due to the my mom, speaking of the ice, my mom is constantly talking about in the news. Apparently, you know, so many of these glaciers are melting. The permafrost is melting yeah. now, and they are finding such cool stuff, like human wise. Yeah, which as the ice is going down uh, too. I'd like horrible, to say that's horrible, oh, that's great, but, cool. but yeah, that's really horrible. <laughs> Yeah. So, All right, anyway, keep going. Due to the way that Laiba died, which scientists believe was snorting up butter like clay into her trunk, having it. What? What a dumb way to die. <laughs> Mammoth. I mean, she was only 30 days old. Ha- Aspirating clay? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And it just got <laughs> stuck, <laughs> stuck in her trunk, suffocated, and she's basically Poor suffocated girl. on the clay. Um, the bacteria that that found her essentially pickled her like one of grandma's cucumbers, making <laughs> her carcass unedible t- to any would-be scavengers. Um, but again, because we said it was quick and that's why they think it was like mud, she probably got stuck in the mud, whether it was they were crossing this area or what, who knows. Yeah. Um, but we know it ha- happened quick. Um, and, and, and we do, froze. and we, yeah, and we do know that it was found in her, like the, that she had stored it up the clay because we found the whole thing and they found the clay in the trunk. So, yeah, so yeah. What, what I'm talking about in this is not scientists Conjecture. inferring like, right. Because right. we have the whole thing. And like I said earlier, it's like what, an autopsy. Yes. It, it, no, it yeah. really was an autopsy. Yeah. Um, so what's fascinating about, so fascinating about Laiba, except for everything that I just said, like I said before, she is perfectly preserved inside and out. When scientists examined her stomach contents, they even found milk from her mother in there. Oh, that's so sad. Yep. Her mom was probably heartbroken. Finding food in mammoth stomachs is fairly common nowadays, um, which is what used to sound very outlandish when it first started. Scientists have been able to tell precisely what mammoths eat because it's still in in there there. it's in there yeah and that would let you know the climate the everything yeah everything um so with laiuba scientists were also able to find fecal matter in her intestines so not only do we have a preserved specimen from forty one thousand years ago wrap your mind around that for a second like that's yeah forty one thousand years ago in your it's right there in yeah. front of you. Mind blowing. Right, like the day it died. Almost. Yes, pretty yeah. pretty much. But anything in her stomach is also perfectly preserved. So while finding these creatures are an amazing advancement for science, sometimes finding such creatures can lead to questionable actions. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> right. Uh, there are some scary implications for preserved specim- specimens too. Like if everything's preserved, so could the bacteria be. Oh, yes. And the diseases that killed them. Mm-hmm. So as this permafrost melts, who knows what sicknesses we're going to start getting. Terrifying! Or, like in the next one, I think it's pronounced yucca, yucca, Y-U-K-A. 
Um, so this one was also another young mammoth found in this Siberian permafrost is about 28,000 years ago, uh, which is what they dated her. So much younger than Lyuba, but she was believed wait, to be- Wait, 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 14, I thought, wait, how old was- 41,000 years ago. 41, gotcha. 41,000. And this was f- predicted to be about 28,000 gotcha. years ago. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, but she's believed to be about six to eight years old at her time of death. Discovered in 2010, Yuka was believed to have died in a shallow pond or a lake, given that, you know, what was found in proximity to her. Yeah. Uh, Yuka is the most perfectly preserved mammoth mummy in the world. Uh, even better off than Yayuba. We thought that that was like amazing. Three years later, here comes the second one. But again, here's the water coming into play. Yep. Too. Every time. Helped a lot. Yeah. So Yayuka uh, also has a f- uh, fantastically preserved stomach and fantastic tissue samples. So what do scientists do with Ryuka? Scientists in Japan have gone full Jurassic Park on us. Yep. Which, like, not fully, but they're getting there. So scientists have extracted tissue from her bone marrow and muscle and injected it into mice germ cells. Now, germ cells, um, I'm talking about reproductive cells, not like cough, cough germ cells, you know, like actual reproductive germ cells. So once in the germ cells, the mammoth cells started to show signs of cellular activities. Which is insane. You can resurrect dead tissue that's been dead for that long. So as they were in those germ cells, they started showing activity that they normally would right before a cell would start to divide. So they are like on the brink of making it happen. Right, um, making a mammoth from a test tube. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about like, oh, it just started like wiggling or moving. No, it actually started to reproduce sections, which needed for cell division. Or gotcha. Which is crazy. So it was actively getting close. It's not just like, oh my goodness, I think it's going to start to divide. And it's just like sitting there wiggling. No, it was like creating the steps to get to get there to cell cellular division, which is nuts. So what does Yayuka have to do with fossils telling us an important story of our past? I brought it up because while Layuba does tell us about the past, Yayuka is being used to, to understand science in a whole new way. Is it good? Is it bad? As we come across more and more soft tissues in fossils like scientists did in 2005 when they found collagen fibers in a T-Rex bone, uh, we're going to have to answer a lot of ethics questions. Right. Just because we can, should we? Exactly. And since... That's we, always the science question. And, and since yeah. we've all seen Jurassic Park, minus Kim, uh, life yeah. always <laughs> finds a way. And scientists are going to have to draw a line, you know, somewhere when our story of the past stays in the past or will be used to shape the future. Right. No, that's so... Yeah. The implications are insane. Like... I I feel like there's no way you can possibly think it all out because even like okay for example there are people that have good in, but there are also people that have good intentions and people oh, who have yeah. purposely oh, bad yeah. intentions. Well, I was just gonna bring up like let's just nowadays like let's say you know we have decided you know what could really help take care of this pest is this other insect right from the other part of the world. Yeah, right. So we're, we're gonna we're gonna release them. They're gonna kill all the pests and problem fixed. Nope. <laughs> doesn't happen. Not that easy. And then we get a second problem. So I can only imagine T-Rex what, introducing a species <laughs> from not just another area in the world, another, but another time. time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- we have no idea what that would be like and the parasites that it could bring and the disease and it's the same with plants. Like they can they have resurrected dead flowers. Yeah. Like that's already happened. But, like, should we should we grow them? But it's the same thing as, like, okay, so you don't know, like you said, with the mammoths, it's it's an, it's an, essentially an autopsy. And, and they yeah. take all the precautions. I mean, they're in suits, like, hazmat. Like, you know what I mean? Like, the whole white suits and everything. But you don't know if it died from a bacteria or parasite. So you're cutting into a stomach. You're cutting into a species. And who knows? Because everybody has ba- certain bacteria and totally. guts. So you do not know what you're releasing. And it releasing. might not even, even have been what killed it. Correct. But it could be deadly to us now. Exactly. Because it's been so long. Yeah. Yeah. I would not want to cut into something that hadn't been seen the light of day for millions of years. Yeah. Or 41,000 no years ago. Yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah. So, again, fossils of any variety, um, whether it's humans or mammoths or just traditional finding collagen fibers in T-Rex bones, 
uh, you know, fossils, they do tell us an important part of our past and they're probably going to continue to shape our future as we discover more. Totally. Totally, totally. All right. That's all we have for you guys today. Be sure to check. We exploded some minds. Hopefully. Hopefully you guys learned something. (laughs) So come talk to us. uh, Oh, I need to put up the Discord link. I need to remember that. Make sure you guys go to our social media um, and check out our Discord page where you can talk to us um, and other nature nerd-minded people. So we made that available. Join the Nature Nerd Nation. Yes, definitely do that. The NNN. And follow us on our social media, Instagram, Twitter, at FTLON Podcast. And we will talk to you then. Yep, talk to you guys soon. Bye.